Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, the lecture this afternoon. Uh, delighted to welcome you back, whether you're returning to one of these afternoon classes, having been to one or several before, or whether it's your first time. Uh, either way, we're delighted to see you. My name is Alistair Wilson. Uh, some of you I know already, some of you uh, I don't, but uh, I teach New Testament uh, here at Highland Theological College, and it's my pleasure to uh, lead this class over. It's a short class over the next five weeks, so short and I hope sweet, uh, but uh, I, I do hope you will enjoy it. Before we launch into the class, um, a couple of things just to say by way of introduction. First of all, I think you will have been guided already to sign in. Um, that's a, a fire issue, and also it helps us to keep track of who's uh, interested in these classes. So please be sure to do that each week, um, and uh, there will be a sign-in sheet for you there. Um, also, you may see, uh, or you may have seen, that we are going to have um, a lecture on um, Monday the 6th of November by Nick Needham. Uh, you uh, may already have come across uh, Nick as a teacher or through one of his books, um, a very gifted communicator of church history. And of course, this is the 500th anniversary of the posting of Luther's 95 Theses. And so I'm sure you've heard uh, a good bit about Luther already this year, and uh, the year is not finished yet, so there's plenty of opportunity to hear more. Uh, so please do uh, consider coming along on the evening of Monday the 6th of November, it will, uh, the lecture will take place at the Free Church across the road and it's free of charge and you're very welcome uh, to participate in that. So uh, I suspect that you will already have been guided also about uh, toilet facilities which are available uh, just along the corridor if you uh, require them. So uh, welcome to uh, the class on uh, Luke's Gospel, snapshots of Luke's Gospel. I've called it Luke, Narrative, Fulfillment and Witness. Uh, and uh, hopefully that was an intriguing and enigmatic enough title uh, that it makes you wonder what might be coming. Uh, glad to uh, have your attention today and we're going to pray together and then we'll launch in. <coughs> Our Father, we give you thanks today for uh, your word, for accessibility of your word, that we can read it in a translation that we can understand. We thank you that we have freedom to gather here today uh, to study your word, to consider it, to reflect on its significance. We thank you for what it speaks of and particularly how it speaks of your purposes uh, to gather a people to yourself and the means by which you accomplish that in uh, your son Jesus Christ. Uh, we give you thanks for the way in which uh, the uh, work of your spirit is made clear in Luke's gospel and in the Acts of the Apostles. And for all of these actions of the triune God, Father, Son and Spirit, three in one, uh, we give you thanks because that is the reason for our hope and for our joy today. So help us as we seek to study your word reverently and carefully. Help us to use our minds to the full extent of our ability, um, but also let us listen for your voice in the words of Scripture. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen. So, uh, you should have a handout uh, which gives in list form the outline of the uh, class. I've got slides. Uh, some of the slides uh, you may or may not find uh, that you can read. Hopefully you can read the text there. Um, I moved away from just reproducing the slides because of the small uh, print size. Uh, so I hope you'll follow that um, all right. And uh, so we're going to be looking at <coughs> Luke's Gospel. Uh, and uh, as I say, I've called it Luke, Narrative, Fulfillment and uh, Witness. Now, this is um, the first lecture in a series of uh, five lectures. Our... Uh, title today, our focus, will be on Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, and I've given it uh, the heading, which is just from the uh, text that we'll be looking at, so that you may know the certainty. Now, 
Uh, we'll be looking at five different texts. You may already have seen uh, the advertising for the course and uh, you will already have seen which texts we're going to look at. We're taking snapshots uh, from what is a large document. Uh, we'll see in a moment. Luke uh, makes up a substantial part of the New Testament and there's simply no way, even if we had the whole year to work, that we would be able to go through the whole of Luke's Gospel in detail. So what we're going to do is take a sampling of texts which give a flavour of some of the key themes. Not all of the themes, but some of the key themes of Luke's Gospel. So in the second lecture, we'll uh, look at the theme of a light for revelation to the Gentiles from Luke chapter 2. In lecture 3, uh, this phrase, that is why I was sent, uh, from Luke chapter 4. In the fourth lecture, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost, from Luke chapter 19. And then finally, the fifth uh, class will be, uh, you are witnesses of these things, from Luke chapter 24. So I hope that you will uh, be able to come along for each of the classes, but if you can't, uh, then hopefully each one uh, will stand on its own, and uh, we will be able to uh, see how each one contributes to Luke's message. Uh, please do invite uh, friends and uh, folks in your church to uh, come along and join us if they would like to do so and are able to do so. So today I want to look at um, this broad outline. This is what we will try and cover today. Um, why study the Gospel according to Luke? Uh, what does Luke think he is doing? I'm going to touch on the idea of a missional reading of Luke's Gospel. And then we'll look at selected features and themes, uh, focusing particularly on these words, narrative, fulfillment, and witness. So, first of all, why study the Gospel according to Luke? Uh, well, before I um, talk about the, the quotation that I've put in there, let me say first of all a word about the idea of the Gospel according to Luke. Sometimes you'll hear... Uh, the document that we talk about being described as Luke's Gospel, and then sometimes uh, as the Gospel according to Luke. And that reflects um, a slight ambiguity and a slight change of uh, meaning in the word Gospel. <coughs> because initially, the focus of the, the word Gospel is on the declaration, on the message. Uh, the message which is good news. That's what Gospel means. And so uh, the idea of gospel focuses on that which is proclaimed. But it wasn't long before uh, that gospel was presented by various people. So you then had uh, a variety of documents that were the uh, presentation of Matthew or Mark or Luke or John. And indeed others uh, made various claims to uh, present the gospel in some sense or other. So what initially happened was, in order to distinguish the account of one author from another, you would get the gospel according to. So that was, there's one gospel, one message about Jesus Christ, one message of God's dealings with humanity in the person of Jesus, but four narratives telling that story with different perspectives, as you would expect to find different witnesses uh, giving an account of the same incident that they've seen, but perhaps from slightly different perspectives. So that's why we sometimes talk about the Gospel according to Luke. There is one Gospel, and this is Luke's retelling of that Gospel. However, that then switches in, in, in popular usage, to seeing Gospel as a kind of document. Sometimes we speak about a genre of document. Gospel becomes an identifiable form in itself. And that's when people start to talk about Luke's gospel. So clearly Luke would not want to say, I have a gospel, because uh, he is declaring the same message that the early Christians declared. But it moves into that form of uh, use of the language as the kind of literature becomes recognisable and as uh, he starts to be recognised as the author of one particular uh, of these um, types of literature. 
So having said that about the terminology, let's think about why study Luke's uh, narrative. Why study the Gospel according to Luke? Well, first of all, we see a significant contribution to the, Luke, to the New Testament made by Luke. Now, if we ask the same question, why study Paul? Well, people would think, well, of course you've got to study Paul. Look at all of the documents in the New Testament that are by Paul. Think of their significance. But we might miss the significance of Luke in terms of his contribution to the New Testament. Here's a quotation from uh, a scholar called Daryl Bock. Of the 7,947 verses in the New Testament, Luke Acts comprises 2,157 verses, or 27.1%. So 27.1% of the verses of the New Testament are composed by Luke. By comparison, the Pauline letters have 2,032 verses. And the Johannine writings, that is, uh, John's Gospel, uh, the letters of John, uh, probably Revelation um, will be included in there. Um, but the Johannine writings have 1,407. In addition, only Luke Acts tells the story of Jesus Christ from his birth through the beginning of the church into the ministry of Paul. So there are two uh, areas where Luke gives a significant contribution here. One is simply the volume of material that he provides. His documents are simply a substantial portion, over a quarter of the total New Testament. But also, Luke is the only uh, author to provide that whole narrative from Jesus' birth to uh, the uh, expansion of the early church, um, finally taken to its furthest extent by Paul. So that's one reason uh, to study the Gospel according to Luke. Another is because of the character of the writing that uh, Luke um, provides us with. He is a careful historian and a theologian. In formal academic study of uh, the Gospels some decades ago, it was always regarded that you could either be one or you could be the other, but you couldn't be both a historian and a theologian. As soon as you were a theologian, you were starting to indicate your particular uh, view of reality and that immediately, according to many, uh, disqualified you from being an objective, in inverted commas, historian. But that, is largely, um, that has largely been a discred discredited as a viewpoint and uh, it is now recognised that everybody has a viewpoint, everybody has a perspective on reality and that having that perspective is not a disqualification from being able to present accurate and careful history. So again, Bock provides uh, this perspective. Luke, he says, is a sensitive observer of the events he describes. He is interested in both history and theology. He writes not just about the time sequence of events and teaching, but about their topical and theological relationship as well. He writes as a theologian and pastor, but as one whose direction is marked out by the history that preceded him. To underemphasize any element in the Lucan effort, whether pastoral, theological, or historical, is to underestimate the depth of his account. So I hope that we'll see together that Luke has these three, at least, purposes in terms of what he is writing. He, he writes uh, because he is concerned for history. He is concerned to give an accurate account of what has taken place. He writes with a theological perspective in that he believes that this is the way in which God has done something decisive and um, remarkable in the history of humanity to bring uh, a people to himself. But as Bock says, he also writes with a pastoral intention. He writes to real people within the Christian community who he seeks to help through his writing. So, having looked briefly at some reasons why we might give uh, Luke due attention, we can ask ourselves then, what does Luke think he is doing? And that takes us on to uh, the 
in fact, the, that would take us on to the next slide. I, I took this out of your handout, so I'm going to uh, just look very quickly at the question of who Luke is. So I don't want to get distracted by this, but let me just uh, put it up for a moment. We talk about the Gospel according to Luke, or Luke's Gospel. We might say, well, who is this Luke? Who wrote this Gospel? And my first uh, comment, which I've put up here, is that the work is technically anonymous. Uh, so you will not find anywhere, like you would in the letters of Paul, where Luke says, I, Luke, wrote this gospel. It's simply not there. So technically, it's anonymous. But from a very early stage, it's clear that there were numerous accounts. We'll see more about that. And that people had to identify which narrative of Jesus' life they were dealing with. So I'm going to show you here an image which you don't have um, on your slides, but which you can look up for yourself. It's from a, um, a document called uh, Codex Sinaiticus, uh, because it was found in a monastery on Mount Sinai. And uh, the amazing uh, reality that we have in this world of digital media is that you can now examine manuscripts which in the past you would have had to go to some research library for. And so if you look up Codex Sinaiticus uh, online, you can uh, look at this for yourself. So I've taken an image uh, from that. Uh, the web address is there. If you're interested, I can let you know where to find it. But codexsinaiticus.org. So uh, I don't expect you to be able to read that. But it's quite interesting for you to be able to see what an early manuscript looks like. That is um, a Greek manuscript, a page from the Greek manuscript. A codex is simply a book form like we have now, rather than a scroll. So rather than one uh, long uh, scroll with uh, pages sewn together, uh, this is um, a document that looks more like we are used to in a, in a book form. And so this is the opening uh, page of Luke. So it's all in capital letters in Greek, and you'll see uh, that there's not the same sort of paragraphing that we're used to, or even the word spacing that we're used to in a text. It's just all running together, and you have to use your, uh, your awareness of where one word begins and one word ends to make those divisions in your mind. But what I want to draw your attention to is simply uh, what's at the top there, uh, this says, kata lucan, according to Luke. And so in this uh, manuscript, this 4th century uh, manuscript, you know, that, that's to say it was written in the 300s AD. So it's not the earliest one we have, but it's, uh, it's an early and fairly complete document. That, uh, that document has a heading for Luke's Gospel, according to Luke. And so again, you can see that theological viewpoint that says there's one gospel and this is Luke's version of it. It's the gospel according to Luke. So uh, that's, uh, that's just to say that although the document is technically anonymous, that is, there is nothing in the actual text of the gospel itself to say who wrote it, from a very, very early stage, there was that ascription to Luke. We can get various kinds of information to help us figure out who wrote this document. One kind is external evidence. That is what other writers said about it. So from a very early stage, you have people within the early Christian community making statements about who wrote this document. So I've mentioned there the Muratorian canon and also the church father Irenaeus, uh, both of these documents would date uh, to um, perhaps a hundred, uh, a little over a hundred years after Luke's gospel was written, uh, towards the end of the second century. Uh, Eusebius, the church historian, also uh, records that Luke is the author. So you can get these testimonies from early church uh, authorities. You also can get internal evidence, that is, evidence from the text itself. Now, I've said that there is no uh, self-declared statement about uh, who the author is, but you can do a little bit of detective work. You can do a bit of deducing. So, 
you can say from, uh, with a fair degree of uh, confidence that the person who wrote Acts is the same person who wrote Luke. Uh, we can say that for a variety of reasons, partly the style, but also each one begins with a little um, directed comment to Theophilus, uh, and it's the same person in both cases, and this, the person in Acts says, in my former work, Theophilus, and then describes exactly what the gospel does. So it looks very clear that uh, we have the same author of the gospel and Acts. But he still doesn't say who he is. So we need to then uh, figure out who he might be. So then we go to what are known as we passages. Now in Scottish parlance that might be regarded as very short ones, but that's not what we're talking about. They're we as in the first person plural pronoun. We did this. There are certain narratives. Uh, for instance, the, the story of uh, Paul in, um, in Philippi, where the author of Acts stops saying they did this and they did this and they did this and starts saying we did this. In other words, he puts himself in the story. He becomes a participant in the story. Now, immediately, you can start to do some deducing. Well, you can say, well, who accompanied Paul? And we can find certain references in Paul's letters to people that he had around him at certain points. But then we can say, well, some of these people are described by the author who says we. They are, they are mentioned by name. So uh, the author who says we talks about Paul and Silas in prison. So it's highly unlikely that Silas is the author because he's described by his name, where the author is also using uh, the language of we. So that wouldn't be uh, likely at all. So what you can do by deduction is you can say, Here are, here's the evidence we have for who were Paul's associates. People like Timothy might also come to mind. Oh, was it written by Timothy? No, Timothy is mentioned. Timothy is described uh, by his name. So once you start to stroke all these people who are named in Acts, off the list, you start to come down to a fairly small group, and when you combine that with the external evidence, all of the um, attention focuses on this person who is mentioned in Philemon and Colossians, I think also in 2 Timothy, who is uh, Luke, uh, Paul calls him Luke uh, the physician, um, and this person uh, is from a point of um, deduction regarded as being the author of the document that we call the gospel according to Luke. So that's a little digression from your handout but hopefully it's helpful to have some idea of how we come to the conclusion that this document was written by Luke when it doesn't actually say that in the document itself. Okay, what does Luke think he is doing? Well, we're going to read a short section of the text uh, this quotation comes from the, the Christian Standard Bible, the CSB. Uh, I've just done that because it's uh, something a little different, perhaps, from what you'll have come across. It's a, a very competent translation recently produced by a group of scholars in the United States. And so um, you may well be used to the NIV or the ESV or the King James Version or something else, but this may help you just to see things with a slightly different angle. So... According to the text here, Luke says at the beginning of his gospel, many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed them down to us. It also seemed good to me, since I have carefully investigated everything from the very first, to write to you in an orderly sequence most honourable Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. Now, this is a very uh, striking and uh, distinctive uh, piece of text because it is the only part of um, a gospel narrative that gives the author's perspective 
on what he is doing. Now, there is something a little bit like it in John's Gospel, but not nearly so much about the mechanics and process of the Gospel writing. At the end of, Luke, of John chapter 20, John says um, that many more things could have been written, but these things are written that you might um, believe that Jesus Christ is, uh, Jesus is the Christ, and in believing you might have life in his name. So there is a clear statement of his evangelistic um, purpose in writing the gospel, but not really about how he's gone about it. Whereas Luke tells us the process. He tells us uh, what has led him to write this document. So at this point, I just want to highlight for you uh, that there are four broad areas that we could identify that Luke says he is uh, doing, what he, what he is doing. First of all, he is building on the work of others. Secondly, he is engaging in careful primary research. That is, he is investigating for himself. Thirdly, he is presenting an orderly narrative. And fourthly, he is instructing Theophilus in the faith. Uh, so that's on your second page of your handout. <coughs> So, what does Luke think he is doing? Building on the work of others, engaging in primary uh, research, presenting an orderly narrative, instructing Theophilus in the faith. Now, you'll see that the next uh, slide, marked 8 on your handout, is um, a list of the lines indented a little bit. Um, now, I just want to draw your attention uh, to the slide. Uh, you may, again, have difficulty seeing it in its detail. But just to get an idea of what I'm trying to do with this, <coughs> this is a, a way of presenting a Bible passage known as phrasing. And uh, it may be a helpful thing for you to try out for yourself, especially these days when you can uh, go on to something like BibleGateway.com and you can cut and paste uh, a passage of scripture and you can put it into a word processor. Now, what I encourage uh, my students here to do as they're looking at a passage is to consider how the different clauses and phrases in a passage relate to one another. And often if you lay out a passage in this kind of manner, you start to see relationships between words and phrases that you might not see if they were all just uh, like that uh, codex where they're all just in straight lines and uh, one word after another. So, again, you may not uh, see in detail here, but let me try and point out something of the balance I see in uh, this opening statement from Luke. So, you'll see here, uh, many have undertaken, and I've put that in red. Now, in verse 3, we say, it's also seemed good to me. And I've lined that up. So, many have done this, and it seemed good to me also. So, you can see a contrast. This is what many have done, this is what I have done. Okay? So you can see that there's a balance there. What have they undertaken to do, the many? They have undertaken to compile a narrative. Well, that corresponds with to write to you in an orderly sequence. That's much the same uh, idea. So they compiled a narrative, I've written to you in an orderly sequence. So again, I've put that in the same color and I've lined it up. Even though the, there's a little bit of text in between, I've lined those two bits up because they balance out. They compiled a narrative, what about? About the events that have been fulfilled among us. Well, there, again, it's difficult to tell exactly what to balance up. It's perhaps not quite as obvious. But it talks about they wrote about the events that have been that have been fulfilled. So Luke writes about the things that he has carefully investigated. So I put them in the same colour and balance out with each other. And then the um, the last bit is perhaps not so uh, easy to balance out. But um, here he says just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed them down to us. So here you have the idea of the eyewitnesses passing something on to, um, to Luke and to his contemporaries. Uh, 
And then Luke himself writes, so that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. So as they wrote for me, so that I might know what's happened, so I write for you, so that you might know what happened. And therefore, again, I balance those out. So I would encourage you uh, just to try that out with a, a passage of scripture, whether this one or any passage that you're studying. See whether you can spot balance, pattern uh, in the text of scripture, because often there is remarkable balance and pattern. If you go to something like Colossians chapter 1 and verses 15 to 20, uh, some of you will have uh, looked at that passage with me before. Uh, that has a remarkable balance. There's repetition of phrases, there's contrast, and it's very striking when you see it laid out in a visual way like that. So let me just encourage you, don't be afraid just to try it out and see whether you can spot how words, phrases, and clauses uh, work together when you're reading a passage of Scripture. So I think this helps us to get some sense of what Luke thinks he's doing. Uh, he is conscious of what he's doing, and he lays it out there for us. <clears throat> now, I'm going to look at the detail of these verses in just a moment. But first of all, I want to think about the idea of a missional reading of uh, Luke's Gospel. And uh, so what I mean here is that we uh, look at uh, Luke's Gospel as a document which contributes to, which describes and which contributes the mission which God himself is engaged in and which he commits to his church. And I've drawn on a statement from um, my doctoral supervisor Howard Marshall here, which comes on the, the next slide. And he writes, New Testament theology is essentially missionary theology. By this I mean that the documents came into being as the result of a two-part mission. First, the mission of Jesus, sent by God, to inaugurate his kingdom with the blessings that it brings to people, and to call people to respond to it. And then the mission of his followers, called to continue his work by proclaiming him as Lord and Saviour, and calling people to faith and ongoing commitment to him, as a result of which his church grows. So, we can call Luke's Gospel missional in the sense that it describes what uh, God does in sending Jesus, <laughs> that he might uh, save a people for himself, and then it describes how Jesus, as he uh, is raised from the dead, ascends to heaven. Then the Father and the Son send uh, the Spirit upon the church so that they might engage in mission. So it tells the story of mission. But these documents also contribute to the mission. We can see it. Luke writes, in order that Theophilus might understand. He writes, in order that people might grow in their understanding, that they might be confronted with the reality of Jesus. So the very document itself contributes to the mission of the church. So as we go through Luke, I'll be drawing attention to some of these features of certain passages that focus on what God is doing as he sends Jesus into the world, uh, we'll look at, for instance, the passage where Luke says, that is why I was sent, which is a remarkable statement if you think about it. Uh, would you say to uh, anyone around you, well, I'm in this world because this is why I was sent. It's quite a, it's quite a statement for a person to make. Jesus makes that statement of himself. This is why I was sent. So there is that aspect of it, but there's also the aspect of uh, this um, theme of the church, the people of God, being commissioned to pass on uh, his, uh, the, the news of what God has done in Jesus. 
Right, I'm going to pause here for a moment because uh, we'll, what we'll do now is move on to look at some of the key words and phrases that come up in our passage. So let me just pause for a moment and see if there are any questions that you have about what we've uh, looked at so far. Uh, if not, you're under no obligation and we will allow some time at the end. But if you have any questions, if anything's not clear, then I'm happy to help explain if I can. I'll take it that that's a good sign. But I, I would encourage you, as we're going along, if there are things that I say that either are unclear or that you think are uh, unlikely and provocative and uh, questionable, then by all means, just scribble them down. It's sometimes hard to remember that uh, at a later stage when I ask the question, but uh, scribble something down and then you're very welcome to raise questions with me. Okay, so let's then look at uh, these things that Luke thinks he is doing. Uh, so I've given slides to the various uh, activities that he thinks he's doing, and the first of them was building on the work of others. So I just want to pick up uh, a number of these phrases and just uh, draw attention to them. We won't be able to examine them in, in fine detail, but just to draw attention to them. So first of all, he says, many, many have undertaken. Um, now that's intriguing, isn't it? Um, because we're talking about uh, the early uh, Christian community, Luke's Gospel, uh, when it's dated, there are plenty of people who will argue about that, and it's not really possible to pin it down uh, to a specific uh, year, but it certainly would be within, um, let's say, 30 to 50 years, if we take the most um, wide-ranging options, 30 to 50 years after the time of Jesus. Already, Luke's saying, many have undertaken to uh, draw up an account and so I'm adding to that. Who are the many? Well, the short answer is we don't know. But one interesting question is whether included in that many might be some of the documents that share space in our modern Bibles, uh, in the canon of Scripture. So, for instance, we have Matthew and we have Mark. Were either of those writers, or were any, either of those documents in Luke's mind when he said many have undertaken to draw up an account? We can't tell. We can't tell. But what we do know is that already at this stage there were people who uh, were committed, who felt the importance and who were committed to the task of recording the words and the actions of Jesus. The language of taking in hand uh, doesn't need an awful lot of attention, but it strikes uh, the reader as being something serious. Uh, if you take something in hand, you, you deal with it. It's not just a superficial, uh, flippant thing. And so they take it in hand, they undertake uh, to draw up this uh, account. And here we have one of the key words, uh, so I've put it in bold. Uh, they've drawn up a narrative. Now, a narrative suggests that there is some level of coherence to a text. Some interpreters of the New Testament claimed that the material that we have in our Gospels was all circulating in little units all over the place, and that um, when the Gospel writers put it, as, as is sometimes said of Mark's Gospel, they threaded the units on like a... Like pearls on a string. But the language that Luke uses here, Luke uses here of narrative, suggests that already the materials that have been produced before Luke takes on his role, already there's a measure of coherence, there's a unit. Now that doesn't mean that the whole gospel, just as Luke has it, was already written by these people in each case. Perhaps there were units of text, perhaps a group of stories about Jesus' actions, or perhaps a group of parables. Uh, there may have been units of text without the whole gospel, which would have been passed on within the early Christian community. It's almost certain that there was a clear way in which the early Christians were sharing the um, message of Jesus' 
by word of mouth before the, the texts were finally formed into full Gospels. But it does also suggest that they weren't doing it just in little bits and pieces, but they were putting them together in, uh, or rather keeping them together in uh, coherent units. So a narrative suggests uh, a story. Things fulfilled. Luke says that those who have drawn up these narratives have drawn them up concerning the things that have been fulfilled. And it's a very striking term. It's not just the things that have happened, but the things that have been fulfilled. Fulfillment uh, will bring to mind for a lot of us the idea of prophecy. Something is prophesied and then it's fulfilled. Uh, and that's certainly um, a, a valid way of uh, reading uh, the language that part of what Luke is thinking of here is undoubtedly that there were um, promises that God made in the past and they lead to the completion. Um, we'll look uh, next week at the story of Simeon and uh, how Simeon says, now you can let your uh, servant depart in peace because I have seen what you promised. So there's that element of fulfilment. There's also, I think, the element, uh, as some have put it, of the story of uh, the work of God up to that point being filled full. Uh, that is, that things which weren't perhaps there as promises or predictions as such, nonetheless find their fullness. Uh, they find their fullness in Jesus. So, for instance, you might think of something like the sacrificial system. Uh, and the sacrificial system in, uh, in the Old Testament finds its fullness, finds its full expression in Jesus the Saviour. So Luke doesn't just think of these things in bare historical sense. Here we see very much Luke's theological perspective. He says these things that have taken place amongst us haven't just happened, they have been fulfilled. Also, we find the language being used of handed down. Uh, the people who uh, had witnessed these things, who had uh, taken note of them, handed down uh, the materials to Luke. Now, that immediately, perhaps, draws your attention to the fact that Luke does not claim to be an eyewitness of the events himself. Uh, we uh, find Luke saying... He has drawn on that which has been handed down to him. It's the language of uh, tradition. Uh, tradition in a good sense, not in a bad sense. It's the language of something carefully handed down. Paul uses similar language uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians of the early uh, core of the gospel message. That which was handed to me, that I also handed on to you. Uh, so... Uh, there is a sense in which Luke is a recipient, and he's a recipient from those who were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Uh, so we find there the three key terms that we're thinking of, narrative, fulfillment, witness. So although Luke is not an eyewitness, and he says he's received the testimony, that does not mean that he's not interested in eyewitness testimony. He is interested in eyewitness testimony, but it comes from others. And he says, I'm relying on this testimony because I know from whom it came. These eyewitnesses he describes as servants of the word. That is, people devoted to uh, scripture, devoted, no doubt, uh, to Jesus Christ as Christians, and therefore reliable in what they provide. So Luke builds on the work of others. A um, Latin American theologian called Justo Gonzalez uh, says the word to, or in our translation also, is important. Because with it, Luke acknowledges the value of the work of others. He's not writing to correct them. He is writing a new history because he has a specific purpose. The new history is based not on a different past, but on a specific present. The new history becomes necessary because the same events 
are being read from new perspectives. That is to say, we might ask, why would Luke bother to write an account when many others have already done it? And Gonzalez uh, suggests that the primary reason is not because Luke is dissatisfied with what others have done, but rather there is a particular need on the part of Theophilus, per perhaps on the part of uh, the uh, Christian community that Luke uh, is writing for, there is a particular need to understand the gospel for their particular situation, for their particular time. That is to say, even although the history remains the same, there is still a need for fresh retellings of that history as time goes on. So although now uh, we do not add new gospels uh, to the canon, the canon is fixed, yet there is a fresh opportunity each time we come to the gospel to hear it for ourselves, to see its application for our uh, time and for our Christian communities. So, first of all, building on the work of others. But Luke does not act uncritically. Uh, we, and uh, here we're on the final uh, page of the handout, we'll be glad to see. Uh, Luke does not act uncritically, but rather he engages in careful research. So although he is appreciative and gives due uh, acknowledgement and respect to the work that others have done, he then says, it seemed good to me also, having carefully investigated. Uh, now, so it seemed good to me also, Luke says, I stand along with these authors of the past. I, uh, I share their commitment to the importance of this narrative, to the importance of retelling it, and uh, for the importance of making sure it communicates with my community. But it's not going to be done in a way that simply takes for granted what has uh, been said, but Luke checks his sources. Now, this is a wonderful lesson for anyone uh, who is either a student here or, uh, in fact, in any other uh, context in life, check your sources. Uh, there are many uh, things that are said uh, in this world, especially in the world of social media, where things can be shared with the click of a button, where something is shared, something is passed on, which simply is not accurate. Uh, you may get uh, a, a post, and it sounds like it's a, a very uh, significant and important thing, and so you share it. But then you discover that actually that post was inaccurate. It uh, did not uh, provide accurate information. So it's a good thing always to check your sources. There's a, a quip that you sometimes uh, see on the internet uh, that attributions of quotations on the internet are uh, often unreliable. Uh, signed Jane Austen. So, you clearly, uh, you recognise, well, it wasn't Jane Austen that said that, speaking about the internet, but that illustrates that danger that we say, oh, that's a wonderful quotation by C.S. Lewis. But then you find, well, C.S. Lewis never said that. Uh, and it might be a wonderful quotation, and it might be very heartening and very, uh, very positive, but you should check whether the person that is claimed to have said it, said it. Luke was not guilty of passing on posts without checking his, uh, his origins. He checked. The language he uses is he carefully followed from the beginning. Now, because he's already said that he received his information from eyewitnesses, it seems highly unlikely that what he means by carefully followed from the beginning is that he was actually a follower of Jesus from the beginning. That doesn't seem to tie in with what he says in the very same paragraph. So what it more likely means is not followed in a literal sense, but followed in a, an investigative sense. He has carefully investigated, which is the way that many translations uh, take this. So he engaged in careful research. Then we find that he writes an orderly narrative. So it seemed good to him to write. It's striking that writing 
was such an important part of the early Christian uh, community. If it wasn't that the early Christians had written, if they had just preached, then we wouldn't have uh, their documents. But Paul and Luke and John wrote, and because they wrote, we have that literary remain, um, the, the literary remains that they leave as the canonical documents. And so, in a sense, there's a, a real uh, way in which Paul's imprisonment was a distinct blessing for the church. Because if Paul had been able to visit his churches, then he wouldn't have had to write. He probably saw the letters in some sense as a second level uh, to um, actually being present. He would have liked to have been present, but he couldn't be because he was prevented. But that situation of being prevented from visiting face to face enabled the church uh, in God's providence to have the scriptures that are written. So Luke writes because writing is a significant um, part of the care and instruction that he seeks to uh, offer to the church. Uh, perhaps we need to think more carefully about how we foster and encourage writing within our churches as a means of reaching uh, throughout the world and throughout the ages, uh, whereas uh, a speaker can only speak uh, for uh, his or her lifetime, uh, although that's changed with digital uh, communications, certainly in the past that was the case, but with writing, uh, the writing can reach into all places at all times. So Luke writes, he writes for you or to you. The little Greek expression could mean either uh, way. So uh, we might say Luke just writes, it seemed good to write to you. But I think that there might be something of the, the sense that it's for Theophilus' benefit. It's not just writing to Theophilus, but it's writing for his benefit. And so that would be an, al an alternative translation that would be perfectly valid. But he doesn't just write, he writes accurately and in sequence. Now, just as we think about that, we have to be aware that saying accurately and in sequence does not necessarily mean absolutely in chronological order. There are various ways that you can put something uh, in sequence. So imagine that you have, um, just visualize it for a moment, a, a, a number of geometric shapes. So imagine a cube and a sphere and um, a cylinder and a, I don't know, um, a pyramid. So you've got those shapes in your mind now. Okay, now imagine that you multiply the number. Some of them are large, some of them are small. Okay, so you've got these different shapes, but some of them are large, some of them are small. And now imagine that you've got Amongst all of these different shapes and all of these different sizes, some of them are red and some of them are blue. So what will it mean to put them in order? Well, it depends which order, doesn't it? If the order is put the large things together then that will, uh, and separate them from the small things, then you'll have all kinds of different shapes, all kinds of different colours, but all large together, whereas the small ones are uh, distinct. But what if the order is put the red ones together and the blue ones together? Then suddenly you'll have different sizes and shapes, but all the blue will be together, all the red will be together. So all I want you to, to recognise here is that when Luke says that he does what he does accurately and um, in sequence, that does not only necessarily mean that everything happens in temporal order. There may be a variety of reasons, and we'll look at that a little bit uh, in a future class, as to why things might be ordered in a slightly different way. So we've seen that he is building on the work of others, he's engaging in careful research, he's writing an orderly narrative, and he is instructing Theophilus in the faith. So why does he write? He says, I write in order that... That is, he writes with a purpose, uh, not just to record information, but with a distinct purpose. What is the purpose? That you might know there is intellectual um, grasping of 
facts and details. The certainty. That's a striking statement. Luke is pastorally concerned for Theophilus. He doesn't just want Theophilus to be aware. He wants him to be convinced. About what? About the things you have been taught. In other words, Theophilus is not just hearing this for the first time. He's already been instructed. He's already received uh, some instruction in Christianity. Luke now provides his work, not as the first point of contact with the gospel, but as a means of reassuring and reaffirming uh, Theophilus in what he has heard. So, uh, I've just made a reference there uh, to reading. Uh, you're not required to buy anything or to get anything, but there are some very useful resources. This is one book that uh, I use a lot, although it's probably quite a large book for, for most of you, uh, but there are some uh, wonderful resources. Daryl Bock, whose name I've mentioned there, uh, if you look him up on Amazon, you'll find that he has devoted his life to writing on Luke, and so his commentaries uh, range from little short ones to massive big bricks of things. Uh, so um, he has uh, really written on Luke and Acts again and again and again in different ways and at different levels. So if you look out for something by him, I'm sure you'd find that useful. So the conclusion, what do we want to say about uh, Luke, how Luke describes his work? Well, Luke writes his gospel, first of all, as a coherent and persuasive narrative. He's telling a story, and he does it with great skill and with great uh, flair as a storyteller. Secondly, he writes his gospel relating the events that are the fulfillment of God's promises and purposes. So he has that theological uh, sense that what he is telling is the story of how God is bringing his purposes to fulfillment. And then... Finally, Luke writes his gospel based on the witness of others and as a means of witness to Theophilus and the wider church. Uh, so he relies on what others have told him, but he also provides a means of witness, of testimony, of mission uh, for Theophilus and for the wider church. And so that is uh, all that I want to say uh, to you today. Um, I'm very happy to take any questions if uh, we have a couple of minutes uh, at the end before we finish, but I'm also willing to, to give a little time if anyone uh, wants to ask anything and, and you don't have to rush off. If you do have to rush off at exact, exactly three, please feel free to do so. Um, but we've got a couple of minutes. Anyone want to ask anything that has come up? Yes, sir. Under section 11. Yes. Uh, bearing in mind what is written by Luke about when the Saviour met the two on the way to Emmaus, he mentions one as Cleopas. Uh, there's been a question, was he the other person himself? Uh, that's, that's, an interesting, uh, that's an interesting question. I have to say that I haven't um, come across that idea directly. Um, so I suppose that it is... Um, I suppose that it, that it is conceivable in a, in a broad sense, although it, it would again be a somewhat unusual way of expressing things when Luke will at other times say, we did this. So where, where he's involved in an action, he will often put it in acts in the first person pronoun, we did. So you might have expected him to say something of a similar nature there if he was involved. Now, of course, there might have been reasons why, uh, why if he were involved, he chose not to do that. But I would be, I would be inclined to think that unlikely, even though it's a possibility. But it's, it's certainly an interesting puzzle. Uh, we don't know who that second person uh, was. There's no attempt to name the second person. I've also heard is that Cleopas's wife, um, but really we have no grounds to to make a judgment on that. But we do presume there were two men. Um, we probably do presume it. I don't know whether there is a reason for that. Um, I, haven't, I haven't checked whether there's a, a, a grammatical reason or anything like that that would make it required to be that. But, that, but certainly the idea of, of it being Cleopas, 
Cleopas's wife has been suggested, in which case that would challenge that idea. So it's a, it's a good question, uh, something I have to look into. If anyone finds anything uh, to help with that puzzle, I'd be interested to hear what you discover. Anything else you want? Yes? Well, I'm wondering about Luke's social location, cultural background. Um, so you said he probably wasn't with Jesus from the beginning, but he, so he was a Greek speaker, clearly. He seems to be um, a Greek speaker, yes. And his education level, what do you know about his education level, his cultural background, social location, languages he wrote and spoke at home, was it Hebrew? Okay, so, they... so he, he typically, when he quotes the Old Testament, he typically uses the Greek translation, so where, where he quotes a passage, it reflects the Greek translation of the New Testament, which is what most of the early Christian community would have used, apart from a few people within um, Israel who were Hebrew speakers. Um, so most would have used the Greek translation. So that it suggests that he's a Greek speaker, primarily. Um, he, some people, there, there was a tradition that Luke... Um, wrote in such a way that showed he was a doctor. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's generally been slightly modified in recent years in saying that the vocabulary that he uses is often very careful, very precise, but it's not unique to what a doctor would have used. So what um, people tend to argue now is that he was an educated person, he has a range of vocabulary, um, the, the quality of the Greek in the, the first few verses, is the kind of almost classical style. It's very carefully constructed. Um, but then immediately when he starts to tell the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth, it starts to go into a style that's much more Hebraic and Old Testament-like. So he's got that storytelling ability that allows him to shift um, style so that if you read, for instance, in Acts, the speech of Peter in Acts 2 sounds different from the speech of Paul in Acts 17. Now, Luke hasn't kind of blurred them out so that it just sounds like Luke. They each sound uh, something like them themselves. They have a different character. So, an educated man, a Greek speaker, um, he is generally understood to be a Gentile, although that's debated. But that would be the common uh, view of, of Luke. Not Jewish, then? Not, that's not the, the main... Uh, somebody, view. Some, somebody, some have argued for that. Somebody told me that all of the writers of the Bible were Jewish men. Okay. But I don't know, I mean, I, I don't have any sure. sources for but, that. But, well, Luke would be contested at least. I mean, there, there might be some disagreement. Okay, uh, I think probably I should, well, I, I've got one other. If, if you need to go, I've got a minute, I can spare a minute or two. Um, so I'll let Jimmy ask the question, but if you need to go, please feel free to do so. So, Alistair, how much do we know about Theophilus then? Okay, we actually know, know almost nothing. Okay. Um, so, some have actually claimed that it's, it's like a way of speaking about the early Christian community because it means lover of God. But most would say that it is probably a distinguished person who gave some support to Luke in his writing. Okay, thank, you. thank you very much, folks. Let's draw it a close there and let me pray with you as we finish. Gracious Father, thank you for your word, thank you for our time together, thank you for each one here uh, who is keen to learn more, uh, and we pray that the little time we've been able to spend will stimulate our thinking, will encourage us to dig for ourselves in scripture. We thank you for the resources that are available to help us, and we pray that we'll be able to use all of these things so that we can understand your word better and so that we can uh, devote ourselves uh, in your grace more fully to Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much, folks, and all been well. I'll see you uh, next time. If you can't make it next time, then by all means come when you can. Would we, would we be able to drop you a question by email? Hey, you're very welcome to do that. Um, so my email is alistair.wilson at uhi.ac.uk. So it's... It, um, but, but you're welcome to speak to me afterwards and I can give you the email address. So you're welcome to do that um, if you wish to do so. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>